Welcome to English Audiobooks. Listen, read, and learn. Immerse yourself in our world of storytelling, enhanced with free ebooks linked below. Your likes and engagement help our community grow. Sit back, relax, and let's enjoy this literary journey together. Appointment in Tomorrow by Fritz Lieber Is it possible to have a world without moral values? Or does lack of morality become a moral value also? The first angry rays of the sun, which, startlingly enough, still rose in the east at 24-hour intervals, pierced the lacy tops of Atlantic combers and touched thousands of sleeping Americans with unconscious fear because of their unpleasant similarity to the rays from World War III's atomic bombs. They turned to blood the witch circle of rusty steel skeletons around Inferno in Manhattan. Without comment, they pointed a cosmic finger at the tarnished brass plaque commemorating the martyrdom of the three physicists after the dropping of the hell bomb. They tenderly touched the rosy skin and strawberry bruises on the naked shoulders of a girl sleeping off a drunk on the furry and radiantly heated floor of a nearby roof garden. They struck green magic from the glassy blot that was old Washington. Twelve hours before, they had revealed things as eerily beautiful and as ravaged in Asia and Russia. They pinked the white walls of the colonial dwelling of Morton Operly near the Institute for Advanced Studies. Upstairs they slanted impartially across the pharaoh-like and open-eyed face of the elderly physicist and the ugly. Sleep surly one of young Willard Farquhar in the next room. In a nearby New Washington they made of the spire of the Thinker's Foundation a blue and optimistic glory that outshone White House, Jr. It was America approaching the end of the 20th century. America of jukebox burlesque and your local radiation hospital. America of the mask fad for women and mystic Christianity. America of the off-the-bosom dress and the new blue loss. America of the endless war and the loyalty detector. America of marvelous Maisie and the monthly rocket to Mars. America of the thinkers and, a few remembered, the Institute. Knock on titanium, oh, what do you do for blackouts, a oh, please, lover. Don't think when I'm around. America, as combat shocked and crippled as the rest of the bomb shattered planet. Not one impudent photon of the sunlight penetrated the triple paned, polarizing windows of George Helmuth's bedroom in the Thinker's Foundation, yet the clock in his brain awakened him to the minute, or almost. Switching off the educational Sandman in the midst of the phrase, uh, applying tensor calculus to the nucleus, uh, he took a deep, even breath and cast his mind to the limits of the world and his knowledge. It was a somewhat shadowy vision, but, he noted with impartial approval, definitely less shadowy than yesterday morning. Employing a rapid mental scanning technique, he next cleared his memory chains of false associations, including those acquired while asleep. These chores completed, he held his finger on a bedside button, which rotated the polarizing window panes until the room slowly filled with a muted daylight. Then, still flat on his back, he turned his head until he could look at the remarkably beautiful blonde girl asleep beside him. Remembering last night, he felt a pang of exasperation, which he instantly quelled by taking his mind to a higher and dispassionate level from which he could look down on the girl and even himself as quaint, clumsy animals. Still, he grumbled silently, Caddy might have had enough consideration to clear out before he awoke. He wondered if he shouldn't have used his hypnotic control of the girl to smooth their relationship last night, and for a moment the word that would send her into deep trance trembled on the tip of his tongue. But no, that special power of his over her was reserved for far more important purposes. Pumping dynamic tension into his 20-year-old muscles and confidence into his 60-year-old mind, the 40-year-old thinker rose from bed. No covers had to be thrown off. The nuclear heating unit made them unnecessary. He stepped into his clothing, the severe tunic, tights, and sacassins of the modern businessman. Next, he glanced at the message tape beside his phone, washed down with ginger ale a vitamino enzyme tablet, and walked to the window. There, gazing along the rows of newly planted mutant oaks lining Decontamination Avenue, his smooth face broke into a smile. It had come to him, the next big move in the intricate game making up his life and mankind's. Come to him during sleep as so many of his best decisions did, because he regularly employed the time-saving technique of somno-thought, which could function at the same time as somno-learning. He set his who, where? Robot for a rocket physicist and a genius class.
While it worked, he dictated to his steno robot the following brief message. Dear fellow scientist, a project is contemplated that will have a crucial bearing on man's future in deep space. Ample non-military government funds are available. There was a time when professional men scoffed at the thinkers. Then there was a time when the thinkers perforce neglected the professional men. Now both times are past. May they never return. I would like to consult you this afternoon. Three o'clock sharp, Thinkers Foundation I. George Helmuth. Meanwhile the who? Where? had tossed out a dozen cards. He glanced through them, hesitated at the name of Willard Farquhar, or looked at the sleeping girl, then quickly tossed them all into the addresser robot and plugged in the steno robot. The buzz light blinked green and he switched the phone to audio. The president is waiting to see Maisie, sir, a clear feminine voice announced. He has the general staff with him. Martian peace to him, a George Helmuth said. Tell him I'll be down in a few minutes. Huge as a primitive nuclear reactor, the great electronic brain loomed above the knot of hush-voiced men. It almost filled a two-story room in the Thinker's Foundation. Its front was an orderly expanse of controls, indicators, telltales, and terminals, the upper ones reached by a chair on a boom. Although, as far as anyone knew, it could sense only the information and questions fed into it on a tape. The human visitors could not resist the impulse to talk in whispers and glance uneasily at the great cryptic cube. After all, it had lately taken to moving some of its own controls, the permissible ones, and could doubtless improvise a hearing apparatus if it wanted to. For this was the thinking machine beside which the marks and ENIACs and maniacs and matadas and minervas and memirs were less than morons. This was the machine with a million times as many synapses as the human brain the machine that remembered by cutting delicate notches in the rims of molecules instead of kindergarten paper punching or the Coney Island shimmying of columns of mercury. This was the machine that had given instructions on building the last three quarters of itself. This was the goal, perhaps, toward which fallible human reasoning and biased human judgment and feeble human ambition had evolved. This was the machine that really thought a million plus. This was the machine that the timid cyberneticists and stuffy professional scientists had said could not be built. Yet this was the machine that the thinkers, with characteristic Yankee push, had built. And nicknamed, with characteristic Yankee irreverence and girl fondness, Maisie. Gazing up at it, the President of the United States felt a cord plucked within him that hadn't been sounded for decades, the dark and shivery organ cord of his Baptist childhood. Here, in a strange sense, Although his reason rejected it, he felt he stood face to face with the living God, infinitely stern with the sternness of reality, yet infinitely just. No tiniest error or willful misstep could ever escape the scrutiny of this vast mentality. He shivered. The grizzled general, there was also one who was gray, was thinking that this was a very odd link in the chain of command. Some shadowy and usually well-controlled memories from World War II faintly stirred his ire. Here he was giving orders to a being immeasurably more intelligent than himself. And always orders of the it tell me how to kill that man or rather than they kill that man of sort. The distinction bothered him obscurely. It relieved him to know that Maisie had built-in controls which made her always the servant of humanity or of humanity's right-minded leaders. Even the thinkers weren't certain which. The gray general was thinking uneasily and, like the president, at a more turbid level, of the resemblance between papal infallibility and the dictates of the machine. Suddenly his bony wrists began to tremble. He asked himself, was this the second coming? Mightn't an incarnation be in metal rather than flesh? The austere Secretary of State was remembering what he'd taken such pains to make everyone forget. His youthful flirtation at Lake Success with Buddhism. Sitting before his guru, his teacher, feeling the Occidentals ought the wisdom of the East, for its pretense, he had felt a little like this. The burly Secretary of Space, who had come up through United Rockets, was thanking his stars that at any rate the professional scientists weren't responsible for this job. Like the grizzled general, he'd always felt suspicious of men who kept telling you how to do things, rather than doing them themselves. In World War III he'd had his fill of the professional physicists, with their eternal taint of a misty sort of radicalism and free thinking. The thinkers were better, more disciplined, more human. They'd called their brain machine Maisie, which helped take the curse off her. Somewhat. The president's secretary, 
A paunchy veteran of party caucuses was also glad that it was the thinkers who had created the machine, though he trembled at the power that it gave them over the administration. Still, you could do business with the thinkers. And nobody, not even the thinkers, could do business, that sort of business, with Maisie. Before that great square face with its thousands of tiny metal features, only George Helmuth seemed at ease, busily entering on the tape the complex questions of the day that the high officials had handed him, logistics for the endless war in Pakistan, optimum size for next year's sugar corn crop, current thought trends and average Soviet mines. Profound questions, yet many of them phrased with surprising simplicity. For figures, technical jargon, and layman's language were alike to Maisie. There was no need to translate into mathematical shorthand, as with the lesser brain machines. The click of the taper went on until the Secretary of State had twice nervously fired a cigarette with his ultrasonic lighter and twice quickly put it away. No one spoke. George looked up at the Secretary of Space. Section 5, Question 4, Whom would that come from? The burly man frowned. That would be the physics boys, Operlis group. Is anything wrong? George did not answer. A bit later he quit taping and began to adjust controls, going up on the boom chair to reach some of them. Eventually he came down and touched a few more, then stood waiting. From the great cube came a profound, steady purring. Involuntarily the six officials backed off a bit. Somehow it was impossible for a man to get used to the sound of Maisie starting to think. George turned, smiling. And now, gentlemen, while we wait for Maisie to celebrate, there should be just enough time for us to watch the takeoff of the Mars rocket. He switched on a giant television screen. The others made a quarter turn, and there before them glowed the rich ochres and blues of a New Mexico sunrise and, in the middle distance, a silvery mighty spindle. Like the generals, the Secretary of Space suppressed a scowl. Here was something that ought to be spaying in the center of his official territory, and the thinkers had locked him completely out of it. That rocket there, just an ordinary Earth satellite vehicle commandeered from the Army, but equipped by the thinkers with Maisie designed nuclear motors capable of the Mars journey and more. The first spaceship and the Secretary of Space was not in on it. Still, he told himself, Maisie had decreed it that way. And when he remembered what the thinkers had done for him in rescuing him from breakdown with their mental science, in rescuing the whole administration from collapse, he realized he had to be satisfied. And that was without taking into consideration the amazing additional mental discoveries that the thinkers were bringing down from Mars. Lord, uh, the president said to George as if voicing the secretary's feeling, Oh, I wish you people could bring a couple of those wise little devils back with you this trip. Be a good thing for the country. George looked at him a bit coldly. It's quite unthinkable, uh, he said. The telepathic abilities of the Martians make them extremely sensitive. The conflicts of ordinary earth minds would impinge on them psychotically, even fatally. As you know, the thinkers were able to contact them only because of our degree of learned mental poise and errorless memory chains. So for the present it must be our task alone to glean from the Martians their astounding mental skills. Of course, someday in the future, when we have discovered how to armor the minds of the Martians. Sure, I know, uh, the president said hastily. Shouldn't have mentioned it. George. Conversation ceased. They waited with growing tension for the great violet flames to bloom from the base of the silvery shaft. Meanwhile, the question tape, like a New Year's streamer tossed out a high window into the night, sped on its dark way along spinning rollers. Curling with an intricate aimlessness curiously like that of such a streamer, it tantalized the silvery fingers of a thousand relays, saucily evaded the glances of ten thousand electric eyes, impishly darted down a narrow black alleyway of memory banks and, reaching the center of the cube, suddenly emerged into a small room where a suave fat man in shorts sat drinking beer. He flipped the tape over to him with practiced finger, eyeing it as a stockbroker might have studied a ticker tape. He read the first question, closed his eyes and frowned for five seconds. Then with the staccato self-confidence of a hack writer, he began to tape out the answer. For many minutes the only sounds were the rustle of the paper ribbon and the click of the taper, except for the seconds the fat man took to close his eyes or to drink or pour beer. Once, too, he lifted a phone, asked a concise question, waited half a minute, listened to an answer, then went back to the grind. Until he came to section 5, 
Question 4. That time he did his thinking with his eyes open. The question was, does Maisie stand for Maelzel? He sat for a while slowly scratching his thigh. His loose, persuasive lips tightened, without closing, into the shape of a snarl. Suddenly he began to tape again. Maisie does not stand for Maelzel. Maisie stands for amazing, humorously given the form of a girl's name. Section 6, Answer 1. The midterm election viewcast should be spaced as follows. But his lips didn't lose the shape of a snarl. 500 miles above the ionosphere, the Mars rocket cut off its fuel and slumped gratefully into an orbit that would carry it effortlessly around the world at that altitude. The pilot unstrapped himself and stretched, but he didn't look out the viewport at the dried mud disk that was Earth, cloaked in its haze of blue sky. He knew he had two maddening months ahead of him in which to do little more than that. Instead, he unstrapped Sappho, used to free fall from two previous experiences and loving it, the fluffy little cat was soon bounding about the cabin in curves and gyrations that would have made her the envy of all back alley and parlor felines on the planet below. A miracle cat in the dream world of free fall. For a long time she played with a string that the men would toss out lazily. Sometimes she caught the string on the fly, sometimes she swam for it frantically. After a while the man grew bored with the game. He unlocked a drawer and began to study the details of the wisdom he would discover on Mars this trip, priceless spiritual insights that would be bombed to war-battered mankind. The cat carefully selected a spot three feet off the floor, curled up on the air, and went to sleep. George Helmuth snipped the emerging answer tape into sections and handed each to the appropriate man. Most of them carefully tucked theirs away with little more than a glance, but the Secretary of Space puzzled over his. Who the devil would Maelzel be? he asked. A remote look came into the eyes of the Secretary of State. Edgar Allan Poe? Uh, he said frowningly, with eyes half closed. The grizzled general snapped his fingers. Sure. Maelzel's chess player. Read it when I was a kid. About an automaton that was supposed to play chess. Poe proved it hit a man inside it. The Secretary of Space frowned. Now what's the point in a full question like that? You said it came from Opera Lee's group? George asked sharply. The Secretary of Space nodded. The others looked at the two men puzzledly. Who would that be? George pressed. The group, I mean. The Secretary of Space shrugged. Oh, the usual little bunch over at the Institute. Heitman, Gregory, Opera Lee himself. Oh, yes, and young Farquhar. Sounds like Opera Lee's getting senile, a George commented coldly. Ide investigata. The Secretary of Space nodded. He suddenly looked tough. I will. Right away. Sunlight striking through French windows spotlighted a ballet of dust motes untroubled by air conditioning. Morton Opperly's living room was well kept, but worn and quite behind the times. Instead of reading tapes, there were books, instead of steno robots, pen and ink, while in place of a 4 by 6 TV screen, a Picasso hung on the wall. Only Opperly knew that the painting was still faintly radioactive, that it had been riskily so when he'd smuggled it out of his bomb-singed apartment in New York City. The two physicists fronted each other across a coffee table. The face of the elder was cadaverous, large-eyed, and tender, fined down by a long life of abstract thought. That of the younger was forceful, sensuous, bulky as his body, and exceptionally ugly. He looked rather like a bear. Operly was saying, oh, so when he asked who was responsible for the Maelzel question, I said I didn't remember. He smiled. They still allow me my absent-mindedness, since it nourishes their contempt. Almost my sole remaining privilege. The smile faded. Why do you keep on teasing the zoo animals, Willard? He asked without rancor. I've maintained many times that we shouldn't truckle to them by yielding to their demand that we ask mazy questions. You and the rest have overruled me. But then to use those questions to convey veiled insults isn't reasonable. Apparently the Secretary of Space was bothered enough about this last one to pay me a copter call within 20 minutes of this morning's meeting at the Foundation. Why do you do it, Willard? The features of the other convulsed unpleasantly. Because the thinkers are charlatans who must be exposed, he rapped out. We know their Maisie is no more than a tea-leaf reading fake. We've traced their Mars rockets and found they go nowhere. We know their Martian mental science is bunk. But we've already exposed the thinkers very thoroughly, 
Opperly interposed quietly. You know the good it did. Farquhar hunched his Japanese wrestler's shoulders. Then it's got to be done until it takes. Opperly studied the bowl of mutated flowers by the coffee pot. I think you just want to tease the animals, for some personal reason of which you probably aren't aware. Farquhar scowled. We're the ones in the cages. Opperly continued his inspection of the flowers' bells. All the more reason not to poke sticks through the bars at the lions and tigers strolling outside. No, Willard, I'm not counseling appeasement. But consider the age in which we live. It wants magicians. His voice grew especially tranquil. A scientist tells people the truth. When times are good, that is, when the truth offers no threat, people don't mind. But when times are very, very bad. A shadow darkened his eyes. Well, we all know what happened to. And he mentioned three names that had been household words in the middle of the century. They were the names on the brass plaque dedicated to the martyred three physicists. He went on, oh, a magician, on the other hand, tells people what they wish were true, that perpetual motion works, that cancer can be cured by colored lights, that a psychosis is no worse than a head cold, that they alive forever. In good times, magicians are laughed at. They're a luxury of the spoiled wealthy few. But in bad times, people sell their souls for magic cures and buy perpetual motion machines to power their war rockets. Farquhar clenched his fist. All the more reason to keep chipping away at the thinkers. Are we supposed to beg off from a job because it's difficult and dangerous? Opperly shook his head. We're to keep clear of the infection of violence. In my day, Willard, I was one of the frightened men. Later, I was one of the angry men and then one of the minds of despair. Now I'm convinced that all my reactions were futile. Exactly. Farquhar agreed harshly. You reacted. You didn't act. If you men who discovered atomic energy had only formed a secret league, if you'd only had the foresight and the guts to use your tremendous bargaining position to demand the power to shape mankind's future. By the time you were born, Willard, Opperly interrupted dreamily, a Hitler was merely a name in the history books. We scientists weren't the stuff out of which cloak and dagger men are made. Can you imagine Oppenheimer wearing a mask or Einstein sneaking into the old White House with a bomb in his briefcase? He smiled. Besides, that's not the way power is seized. New ideas aren't useful to the man bargaining for power. Only established facts or lies are. Just the same, it would have been a good thing if you'd had a little violence in you. No, Dopperly said. I've got violence in me, a Farquhar announced, shoving himself to his feet. Opperly looked up from the flowers. I think you have, he agreed. But what are we to do? Farquhar demanded. Surrender the world to charlatans without a struggle? Opperly mused for a while. I don't know what the world needs now. Everyone knows Newton as the great scientist. Few remember that he spent half his life muddling with alchemy, looking for the philosopher's stone. Which Newton did the world need then? Now you're justifying the thinkers. No. I leave that to history. And history consists of the actions of men, a Farquhar concluded. I intend to act. The thinkers are vulnerable, their power fantastically precarious. What's it based on? A few lucky guesses. Faith healing. Some science hocus pocus on the level of those jukebox burlesque acts between the strips. Dubious mental comfort given to a few nerve torn neurotics in the inner cabinet and their wives. The fact that the thinker's clever stage managing won the president a doubtful election. The erroneous belief that the Soviets pulled out of Iraq and Iran because of the thinker's mind bomb threat. A brain machine that's just a cover for Jan Tregeron's guesswork. Oh, yes, and that hogwash of Martian wisdom. All of it mere bluff. A few pushes at the right times and points are all that are needed, and the thinkers know it. I'll bet they're terrified already and will be more so when they find that we're gunning for them. Eventually, they'll be making overtures to us, turning to us for help. You wait and see. I am thinking again of Hitler, Opperly interposed quietly. On his first half dozen big steps, he had nothing but bluff. His generals were against him. They knew they were in a cardboard fort. Yet he won every battle until the last. Moreover, he pressed on, cutting Farquhar short, that the power of the thinkers isn't based on what they've got, but on what the world hasn't got. Peace, honor, a good conscience.
The front door knocker clanked. Farquhar answered it. A skinny old man with a radiation scar twisting across his temple handed him a tiny cylinder. Radiogram for you, Willard. He grinned across the hall at Operly. When are you going to get a phone put in, Mr. Operly? The physicist waved to him. Next year, perhaps, Mr. Barry. The old man snorted with good-humored incredulity and trudged off. What did I tell you about the thinkers making overtures? Farquhar chortled suddenly. It's come sooner than I expected. Look at this. He held out the radiogram, but the older man didn't take it. Instead, he asked, Who's it from? Tregoron? No, from Helmuth. There's a lot of sugar corn about man's future in deep space, but the real reason is clear. They know that they're going to have to produce an actual nuclear rocket pretty soon, and for that they'll need our help. An invitation? Farquhar nodded. For this afternoon. He noticed Operly's anxious though distant frown. What's the matter? He asked. Are you bothered about my going? Are you thinking it might be a trap, that after the males will question they may figure I'm better rubbed out? The older man shook his head. I'm not afraid for your life, Willard. That's yours to risk as you choose. No, I'm worried about other things they might do to you. What do you mean? Farquhar asked. Operly looked at him with a gentle appraisal. You're a strong and vital man, Willard, with a strong man's prides and desires. His voice trailed off for a bit. Then, oh, excuse me, Willard, but wasn't there a girl once? A Miss Arcady. Farquhar's ungainly figure froze. He nodded curtly, face averted. And didn't she go off with a thinker? If girls find me ugly, that's their business, a Farquhar said harshly, still not looking at Operly. What's that got to do with this invitation? Operly didn't answer the question. His eyes got more distant. Finally, he said, Oh, in my day, we had it a lot easier. A scientist was an academician cushioned by tradition. Willard snorted. Science had already entered the era of the police inspectors, with laboratory directors and political appointees stifling enterprise. Perhaps, I operally agreed. Still, the scientist lived the safe, restricted, highly respectable life of a university man. He wasn't exposed to the temptations of the world. Farquhar turned on him. Are you implying that the thinkers will somehow be able to buy me off? Not exactly. You think I'll be persuaded to change my aims? Farquhar demanded angrily. Operly shrugged his helplessness. No, I don't think you'll change your aims. Clouds encroaching from the west blotted the parallelogram of sunlight between the two men. As the slideway whisked him gently along the corridor toward his apartment, George was thinking of his spaceship. For a moment the silver-winged vision crowded everything else out of his mind. Just think, a spaceship with sails. He smiled a bit, marveling at the paradox. Direct atomic power. Direct utilization of the force of the flying neutrons. No more ridiculous business of using a reactor to drive a steam engine, or boil off something for a jet exhaust. Processes that were as primitive and wasteful as burning gunpowder to keep yourself warm. Chemical jets would carry his spaceship above the atmosphere. Then would come the thrilling order, a set sail for Mars. The vast umbrella would unfold and open out around the stern, its rear or earthward side a gleaming expanse of radioactive ribbon perhaps only an atom thick and backed with a material that would reflect neutrons. Atoms in the ribbon would split, blasting neutrons astern at fantastic velocities. Reaction would send the spaceship hurtling forward. In airless space, the expanse of sails would naturally not retard the ship. More radioactive ribbon, manufactured as needed in the ship itself, would feed out onto the sail as that already there became exhausted. A spaceship with direct nuclear drive, and he, a thinker, had conceived it completely except for the technical details. Having strengthened his mind by hard years of somno learning, mind casting, memory straightening, and sensory training, he had assured himself of the executive power to control the technicians and direct their specialized abilities. Together they would build the true Mars rocket. But that would only be a beginning. They would build the true mind bomb. They would build the true selective microbe slayer. They would discover the true laws of ESP and the inner life. They would even, his imagination hesitated a moment, then strode boldly forward, build the true Maisie. And then, then the thinkers would be on even terms with the scientists.
Rather, they'd be far ahead. No more deception. He was so exalted by this thought that he almost let the slideway carry him past his door. He stepped inside and called, a caddy. He waited a moment, then walked through the apartment, but she wasn't there. Confound the girl, he couldn't help thinking. This morning, when she should have made herself scarce, she'd sprawled about sleeping. Now, when he felt like seeing her, when her presence would have added a pleasant final touch to his glowing mood, she chose to be absent. He really should use his hypnotic control on her, he decided, and again there sprang into his mind the word, a pet form of her name, that would send her into obedient trance. No, he told himself again, that was to be reserved for some moment of crisis or desperate danger, when he would need someone to strike suddenly and unquestioningly for himself and mankind. Caddy was merely a willful and rather silly girl, incapable at present of understanding the tremendous tensions under which he operated. When he had time for it, he would train her up to be a fitting companion without hypnosis. Yet the fact of her absence had a subtly disquieting effect. It shook his perfect self-confidence just a fraction. He asked himself if he'd been wise in summoning the rocket physicist without consulting Tregoron. But this mood, too, he conquered quickly. Tregoron wasn't his boss, but just the thinker's most clever salesman, an expert in the mumbo-jumbo so necessary for social control in this chaotic era. He himself, George Helmuth, was the real leader in theoretics and all-over strategy, the mind behind the mind behind Maisie. He stretched himself on the bed, almost instantly achieved maximum relaxation, turned on the somno learner, and began the two-hour rest he knew would be desirable before the big conference. Jan Tregeron had supplemented his shorts with pink coveralls, but he was still drinking beer. He emptied his glass and lifted it a lazy inch. The beautiful girl beside him refilled it without a word and went on stroking his forehead. Caddy, he said reflectively, without looking at her, there's a little job I want you to do. You're the only one with the proper background. The point is, it will take you away from George for some time. I'd welcome it, she said with decision. I'm getting pretty sick of watching his push-ups and all his other mind and muscle stunts. And that damn somno learner of his keeps me awake. Tregoron smiled. I'm afraid thinkers make pretty sad sweethearts. Not all of them, she told him, returning his smile tenderly. He chuckled. It's about one of those rocket physicists in the list you brought me. A fellow named Willard Farquhar. Caddy didn't say anything, but she stopped stroking his forehead. What's the matter? He asked. You knew him once, didn't you? Yes, she replied and then added, with surprising feeling, of the big, ugly ape. Well, he's an ape whose services we happen to need. I want you to be our contact girl with him. She took her hands away from his forehead. Look, Jan, as she said, or I wouldn't like this job. I thought he was very sweet on you once. Yes, as he never grew tired of trying to demonstrate to me. The clumsy, overgrown, bumbling baby. The man's disgusting, January. His approach to a woman is a child wanting candy and enraged because mama won't produce it on the instant. I don't mind George. He's just a pipsqueak and it amuses me to see how he frustrates himself. But Willard is... A bit frightening? Tregoron finished for her. No? Of course you're not afraid, a Tregoron purred. You're our beautiful, clever caddy who can do anything she wants with any man, and without whose. Look, Jan, this is different, she began agitatedly, and without whose services we'd have got exactly nowhere. Clever, subtle caddy, whose most charming attainment in the ever-appreciative eyes of Papa Jan is her ability to handle every man in the neatest way imaginable and without a trace of real feeling. Kitty caddy, who? Very well, she said with a sigh. I'll do it. Of course you will, Jan said, drawing her hands back to his forehead. And you'll begin right away by getting into your nicest sugar and cream work clothes. You and I are going to be the welcoming committee when that ape arrives this afternoon. But what about George? He'll want to see Willard. That'll be taken care of, Jan assured her. And what about the other dozen rocket physicists George asked to come? Don't worry about them. 
The president looked inquiringly at his secretary across his littered desk in his homey study at White House. Junior is so awkwardly didn't have any idea how that odd question about Maisie turned up in Section 5. His secretary settled his paunch and shook his head. Or claimed not to. Perhaps he's just the absent-minded prof, perhaps something else. The old feud of the physicists against the thinkers may be getting hot again. There'll be further investigation. The president nodded. He obviously had something uncomfortable on his mind. He said uneasily, Do you think there's any possibility of it being true? What? I asked the secretary guardedly. That peculiar hint about Maisie. The secretary said nothing. Mind you, I don't think there is. Oh, the president went on hurriedly, his face assuming a sorrowful scowl. I owe a lot to the thinkers, both as a private person and as a public figure. Lord, a man has to lean on something these days. But just supposing it were true, he hesitated, as before uttering blasphemy. That there was a man inside Maisie, what could we do? The secretary said stolidly, the thinkers won our last election. They chased the commies out of Iran. We brought them into the inner cabinet. We've showered them with public funds. He paused. We couldn't do a damn thing. The president nodded with equal conviction and, not very happily, summed up. So if anyone should go up against the thinkers, and I'm afraid I wouldn't want to see that happen, whatever's true, it would have to be a scientist. Willard Farquhar felt his weight change the steps under his feet into an escalator. He cursed under his breath, but let them carry him, a defiant hulk, up to the tall and mystic blue portals, which silently parted when he was five meters away. The escalator changed to a sly way and carried him into a softly gleaming, high-doned room rather like the antechamber of a temple. Martian peace to you, Willard Farquhar, oh, an invisible voice intoned. You have entered the Thinker's Foundation. Please remain on the slideway. I want to see George Helmuth, a Willard growled loudly. The slyway carried him into the mouth of a corridor and paused. A dark opening dilated on the wall. May we take your hat and coat? A voice asked politely. After a moment, the request was repeated, with the addition of, oh, just pass them through. Willard scowled, then fought his way out of his shapeless coat and passed it and his hat through in a lump. Instantly, the opening contracted, imprisoning his wrists, and he felt his hands being washed on the other side of the wall. He gave a great jerk which failed to free his hands from the snugly padded jives. Do not be alarmed, uh, the voice advised him. It is only an aesthetic measure. As your hands are laved, invisible radiations are slaughtering all the germs in your body, while more delicate emanations are producing a benign rearrangement of your emotions. The rather amateurish curses Willard was gritting between his teeth became more sulfurous. His sensations told him that a towel of some sort was being applied to his hands. He wondered if he would be subjected to a face-washing and even greater indignities. Then, just before his wrists were released, he felt, for a moment only, but unmistakably, the soft touch of a girl's hand. That touch, like the mysterious sweet chink of a bell in darkness, brought him a sudden feeling of excitement, wonder. Yet the feeling was as fleeting as that caused by a lurid advertisement, for as the slideway began to move again, Carrying him past a series of depth pictures and inscriptions celebrating the thinker's achievements, his mood of bitter exasperation returned doubled. This place, he told himself, was a plague spot of the disease of magic in an enfeebled and easily infected world. He reminded himself that he was not without resources, the thinkers must fear or need him, whether because of the Malesel question or the necessity of producing a nuclear power spaceship. He felt his determination to smash them reaffirmed. The slyway, having twice turned into an escalator, veered toward an opalescent door, which opened as silently as the one below. The slyway stopped at the threshold. Momentum carried him a couple of steps into the room. He stopped and looked around. The place was a Sybarite's modernistic dream. Sponge carpeting thick as a mattress and topped with down. Hassocks and couches that looked buttersoft. A domed ceiling of deep glossy blue mimicking the night sky, with the constellations tooled in silver. A wall of niches crammed with statuettes of languorous men, women, beasts. A self-service bar with a score of golden spigots. A depth TV screen simulating a great crystal ball. Here and there barbaric studs of hammered gold that might have been push buttons. A low table set for three with exquisite ware of crystal and gold. 
an ever-changing scent of resins and flowers. A smiling fat man clad in pearl-gray sports clothes came through one of the curtained archways. Willard recognized Jan Tregeron from his pictures, but did not at once offer to speak to him. Instead, he let his gaze wander with an ostentatious contempt around the crammed walls, take in the bar and the set table with its many wine glasses, and finally return to his host. And where, he asked with harsh irony, are the dancing girls? The fat man's eyebrows rose. In there, he said innocently, indicating the second archway. The curtains parted. Oh, I am sorry, the fat man apologized. There seems to be only one on duty. I hope that isn't too much at variance with your tastes. She stood in the archway, demure and lovely in an off-the-bosom frock of pale blue sky lawn edged and mutated mink. She was smiling the first smile that Willard had ever had from her lips. Mr. Willard Farquhar, the fat man murmured, and Miss Arcady Sims. George Helmuth turned from the conference table with its dozen empty chairs to the two mousely pretty secretaries. No word from the door yet, master but one of them ventured to say. George twisted in his chair, though hardly uncomfortably, since it was a beautiful pneumatic job. His nervousness and having to face the twelve rocket physicists, a feeling which, he had to admit, had been unexpectedly great, was giving way to impatience. What's Willard Farquhar's phone? He asked sharply. One of the secretaries ran through a clutch of desk tapes, then spent some seconds whispering into her throat mic and listening to answers from the soft speaker. He lives with Morton Operley, who doesn't have one, as she finally told George in scandalized tones. Let me see the list, George said. Then, after a bit, a try Dr. Welcome's place. This time there were results. Within a quarter of a minute he was handed a phone which he hung expertly on his shoulder. This is Dr. Asa Welcome, a reedy voice told him. This is Helmuth of the Thinkers Foundation, George said icily. Did you get my communication? The reedy voice became anxious and placating. Why, yes, Mr. Helmuth, I did. Very glad to get it too. Sounded most interesting. Very eager to come. But? Yes. Well, I was just about to hop in my copter, my son's copter, when the other note came. What other note? Why, the note calling the meeting off. I sent no other note. The other voice became acutely embarrassed but I considered it to be from you, or just about the same thing. I really think I had the right to assume that. How was it signed? George rapped. Mr. Jan Tregeron. George broke the connection. He didn't move until a low sound shattered his abstraction and he realized that one of the girls was whispering a call to the door. He handed back the phone and dismissed them. They went in a rustle of jackets and skirtlets, hesitating at the doorway but not quite daring to look back. He sat motionless a minute longer. Then his hand crept fretfully onto the table and pushed a button. The room darkened and a long section of wall became transparent, revealing a dozen silvery models of spaceships beautifully executed. He quickly touched another. The models faded and the opposite wall bloomed with an animated cartoon that portrayed with charming humor and detail the designing and construction of a neutron drive spaceship. A third button and a depth picture of deep star-speckled space opened behind the cartoon, showing a section of Earth's surface and in the far distance the tiny ruddy globe of Mars. Slowly a tiny rocket rose from the section of Earth and spread its silvery sails. He switched off the pictures, keeping the room dark. By a faint table light he dejectedly examined his organizational charts for the Neutron Drive project, the long list of books he had boned up on by Somno Learning the concealed table of physical constants and all sorts of other crucial details about rocket physics, a cleverly condensed encyclopedic a pony a to help out his memory on technical points that might have arisen in his discussion with the experts. He switched out all the lights and slumped forward, blinking his eyes and trying to swallow the lump in his throat. In the dark his memory went seeping back, back, to the day when his math teacher had told him, very superciliously, that the marvelous fantasies he loved to read and hoarded by his bed weren't real science at all, but just a kind of lurid pretense. He had so wanted to be a scientist, and the teacher's contempt had cast a damper on his ambition. And now that the conference was canceled, would he ever know that it wouldn't have turned out the same way today? That his summer learning hadn't taken? That his pony wasn't good enough?
that his ability to handle people extended only to credulous farmer presidents and mousy girls in skirtlets? Only the test of meeting the experts would have answered those questions. Tregeron was the one to blame. Tregeron with his sly tyrannical ways. Tregeron with his fear of losing the future to men who really understood theoretics and could handle experts. Tregeron, so used to working by deception that he couldn't see when it became a fault and a crime. Tregeron, who must now be shown the light, or, failing that, against whom certain steps must be taken. For perhaps half an hour George sat very still, thinking. Then he turned to the phone and, after some delay, got his party. What is it now, George? Caddy asked impatiently. Please don't bother me with any of your moods, because I'm tired and my nerves are on edge. He took a breath. When steps may have to be taken, he thought, one must hold an agent in readiness. Caddams, he intoned hypnotically, vibrantly. Caddams. The voice at the other end had instantly changed, become submissive, sleepy, suppliant. Yes, master. Morton Operly looked up from the sheet of neatly pinned equations at Willard Farquhar, who had somehow acquired a measure of poise. He neither lumbered restlessly nor grimaced. He removed his coat with a certain dignity and stood solidly before his mentor. He smiled. Granting that he was a bear, one might guess he had just been fed. You see, he said, they didn't hurt me. They didn't hurt you? Operly asked softly. Willard slowly shook his head. His smile broadened. Operly put down his pen, folded his hands. And you're as determined as ever to expose and smash the thinkers? Of course. The menacing growl came back into the bear's voice, except that it was touched with a certain pleased luxuriousness. Only from now on I won't be teasing the zoo animals, and I won't embarrass you by asking any more males or questions. I have reached the objective at which those tactics were aimed. After this I shall bore from within. Bore from within, or operally repeated, frowning. Now where have I heard that phrase before? His brow cleared. Oh, yes, uh, he said listlessly. Do I understand that you are becoming a thinker, Willard? The other gave him a faintly pitying smile and stretched himself on the couch, gazed at the ceiling. All his movements were deliberate, easy. Certainly, that's the only realistic way to smash them. Rise high in their councils. Out-trick all their trickeries. Organize a fifth column. Then strike. The end justifying the means, of course, Operly said. Of course. As surely as the desire to stand up justifies your disturbing the air over your head. All action in this world is nothing but means. Operly nodded abstractedly. I wonder if anyone else ever became a thinker for those same reasons. I wonder if being a thinker doesn't simply mean that you've decided you have to use lies and tricks as your chief method. Willard shrugged. Could be. There was no longer any doubt about the pitying quality of his smile. Operly stood up, squaring together his papers. So you'll be working with Helmuth? Not Helmuth. Tregeron. The bear's smile became cruel. I'm afraid that Helmuth's career as a thinker is going to have quite a setback. Helmuth, Operly mused. Morganshine once told me a bit about him. A man of some idealism, despite his affiliations. Best of a bad lot. Incidentally, is he the one with whom? Miss Arcady Sims ran off. Willard finished without any embarrassment. Yes, that was Helmuth. But that's all going to be changed now. Operly nodded. Goodbye, Willard, he said. Willard quickly heaved himself up on an elbow. Operly looked at him for about five seconds. Then without a word, walked out of the room. The only obvious furnishings in Jan Tregeron's office were a flat-top desk and a few chairs. Tregeron sat behind the desk, the top of which was completely bare. He looked almost bored, except that his little eyes were smiling. George Helmuth sat across the desk from him, a few feet back, erect and grim-faced, while shadowy in the muted light, Caddy stood against the wall behind Tregeron. She still wore the fur-trimmed Skylon frock she'd put on that afternoon. She took no part in the conversation, seemed almost unaware of it. So you just went ahead and canceled the conference without consulting me? George was saying, you called it without consulting me. Tregeron playfully wagged a finger. Shouldn't do that sort of thing, George. But I tell you I was completely prepared. 
I was absolutely sure of my ground. I know, I know, Etregaron said lightly, but it's not the right time for it. I'm the best judge of that. When will be the right time? Tregoron shrugged. Look here, George, uh, he said. Oh, every man should stick to his trade, to his forte. Technology isn't ours. George's lips thinned. But you know as well as I do that we are going to have to have a nuclear spaceship and actually go to Mars someday. Tregoron lifted his eyebrows. Are we? Yes. Just as we are going to have to build a real Maisie. Everything we've done until now have been emergency measures. Really? George stared at him. Look here, Jan, he said, gripping his knees with his hands. You and I are going to have to talk things through. Are you quite sure of that? Jan's voice was very cool. I have a feeling that it might be best if you said nothing and accepted things as they are. No? Very well. Tregoron settled himself in his chair. I helped you organize the thinkers, but George said, and waited. At least, I was your first partner. Tregoron barely nodded. Our basic idea was that the time had come to apply science to the life of man on a large scale, to live rationally and realistically. The only things holding the world back from this all-important step were the ignorance, superstition, and inertia of the average man, and the stuffiness and lack of enterprise of the academic scientists, their worship of facts, even when facts were clearly dangerous. Yet we knew that in their deepest hearts the average man and the professionals were both on our side. They wanted the new world visualized by science. They wanted the simplifications and conveniences, the glorious adventures of the human mind and body. They wanted the trips to Mars and into the depths of the human psyche. They wanted the robots and the thinking machines. All they lacked was the nerve to take the first big step, and that was what we supplied. It was no time for half measures, for slow and sober plotting. The world was racked by wars and neurosis, in danger of falling into the foulest hands. What was needed was a tremendous and thrilling appeal to the human imagination, an earth-shaking affirmation of the power of science for good. But the men who provided that appeal and affirmation couldn't afford to be cautious. They wouldn't check and double-check. They couldn't wait for the grudging and jealous approval of the professionals. They had to use stunts, tricks, fakes, anything to get over the big point. Once that had been done, once mankind was headed down the new road, it would be easy enough to give the average man the necessary degree of insight to heal the breach with the professionals, to make good in actuality what had been made good only in pretense. Have I stated our position fairly? Tregoron's eyes were hooded. You're the one who's telling it. On those general assumptions we established our hold on susceptible leaders and the mob, George went on. We built Maisie and the Mars rocket and the mind bomb. We discovered the wisdom of the Martians. We sold the people on the science that the professionals had been too high-toned to advertise or bring into the marketplace. But now that we've succeeded, now that we've made the big point, now that Maisie and Mars and science do rule the average human imagination, the time has come to take the second big step, to let accomplishment catch up with imagination, to implement fantasy with fact. Do you suppose I'd ever have gone into this with you, if it hadn't been for the thought of that second big step? Why, I'd have felt dirty and cheap, a mere charlatan, except for the sure conviction that someday everything would be set right. I've devoted my whole life to that conviction, January. I've studied and disciplined myself, using every scientific means at my disposal so that I wouldn't be found lacking when the day came to heal the breach between the thinkers and the professionals. I've trained myself to be the perfect liaison man for the job. Jan, the day's come and I'm the man. I know you've been concentrating on other aspects of our work. You haven't had time to keep up with my side of it. But I'm sure that as soon as you see how carefully I've prepared myself, how completely practical the Neutron Drive rocket project is, you'll beg me to go ahead. Tregoron smiled at the ceiling for a moment. Your general idea isn't so bad, George, but your time scale is out of whack and your judgment is a joke. Oh, yes. Every revolutionary wants to see the big change take place in his lifetime. Cha. It's as if you were watching evolutionary vaudeville and wanted the ape to man act over in 20 minutes. Time for the second big step? George, the average man's exactly what he was 10 years ago except that he's got a new god. 
More than ever, he thinks of Mars as a Hollywood paradise with wise men and yummy princesses. Maisie is mama magnified a million times. As for professional scientists, they're more jealous and stuffy than ever. All they'd like to do is turn the clock back to a genteel dream world of quiet quadrangles and caps and gowns, where every commoner bows to the passing scholar. Maybe in 10,000 years we'll be ready for the second big step. Maybe. Meanwhile, as should be, the clever will rule the stupid for their own good. The realists will rule the dreamers. Those with free hands will rule those who have deliberately handcuffed themselves with taboos. Secondly, your judgment. Did you actually think you could have bossed those professionals, kept your mental footing in the intellectual melee? You a nuclear physicist? A rocket scientist? Why, it's, take it easy now, boy, and listen to me. They'd have torn you to pieces in 20 minutes and glad of the chance. You baffle me, George. You know that Maisie and the Mars rocket and all that are fakes, yet you believe in your somno learning and consciousness expansion and optimism pumping like the veriest yokel. I wouldn't be surprised to hear you'd taken up ESP and hypnotism. I think you should take stock of yourself and get a new slant. It's overdue. He leaned back. George's face had become a mask. His eyes did not flicker from Tregoron's, yet there was a subtle change in his expression. Behind Tregoron, Caddy swayed as if in a sudden gust of intangible wind and took a silent step forward from the wall. That's your honest opinion? George asked, very quietly. It's more than that, a Tregoron told him, just as unmelodramatically. It's orders. George stood up purposefully. Very well, he said. In that case, I have to tell you that. Casually, but with no wasted motion, Tregoron slipped an ultrasonic pistol from under the desk and laid it on the empty top. No, he said, oh, let me tell you something. I was afraid this would happen and I made preparations. If you've studied your Nazi, fascist, and Soviet history, you know what happens to old revolutionaries who don't move with the times. But I'm not going to be too harsh. I have a couple of the boys waiting outside. They'll take you by a copter to the field, then by jet to New Mexico bright and early tomorrow morning. George, you're leaving on a trip to Mars. George hardly reacted to the words. Caddy was two steps nearer Tregoron. I decided Mars would be the best place for you, the fat man continued. The robot controls will be arranged so that your visit to Mars lasts two years. Perhaps in that time you will have learned wisdom such as realizing that the big liar must never fall for his own big lie. Meanwhile, there will have to be a replacement for you. I have in mind a person who may prove peculiarly worthy to occupy your position, with all its perquisites. A person who seems to understand that force and desire are the motive powers of life, and that anyone who believes the big lie proves himself strictly a jerk. Caddy was standing behind Tregoron now, her half-closed, sleepy eyes fixed on George's. His name is Willard Farquhar. You see, I too believe in cooperating with the scientists, George, but by subversion rather than conference. My idea is to offer the hand of friendship to a selected few of them, the hand of friendship with a nice big bribe in it. He smiled. You were a good man, George, for the early days, when we needed a publicist with catchy ideas about mind bombs, ray guns, plastic helmets, fancy sweaters, space braziers, and all that other corn. Now we can afford a soldier. George moistened his lips. We'll have a neat explanation of what's happened to you. Callers will be informed that you've gone on an extended visit to imbibe the wisdom of the Martians. George whispered, Academs. Caddy leaned forward. Her arms snaked down Tregoron's, as if to imprison his wrists. But instead she reached out and took the ultrasonic pistol and put it in Tregoron's right hand. Then she looked up at George with eyes that were very bright. She said very sweetly and sympathetically, a poor Superman. 